different parts of the country are also affected by equally devastating natural disasters like earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, among other. In fact, um, we don't want to be in this list, but the Philippines has been consistent in the list of top countries that are prone to disasters. I think our ranking now is third. Um, in terms of highest exposure and risk to natural hazards in natural hazards worldwide, according to the 2017 World Risk Index. So, number three, Tahibo. Mas gusto sana natin sa ating mga categories, Tahibo. In the recent years, we've experienced the worst natural disasters from typhoons on Roy, Sendong, Pablo. Uh, we've also had the 2013 uh, earthquake in the Visayas region. And of course, Yolanda, one of the strongest typhoons to ever hit the country. These disasters have in some way pushed us to do better when it comes to the RRM. But while we have some efforts as well as improvements in the way our country deals with natural disasters, we still have a lot to go and there are still challenges that we have to face along the way. These challenges include the way we use our funds in preparing for, responding to, and mitigating disasters. Are our national and local governments using our resources efficiently? We also have to check how prepared our institutions are and whether our government is aware of best practices when it comes to disaster management. Um, our speakers today, Dr. Sunny Domingo, um, PIDS Senior Research Fellow, and Dr. Mahalea Rabago from the University of the Philippines, have been doing a lot of work in this particular area of research and for today to shed more light on these challenges to help us think of solutions to address them. Um, Dr. Sunny Domingo will share with us his assessment of the National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Council and whether the RRM resources are being distributed properly to concerned national agencies and NGOs in the country. Meanwhile, Dr. Rabago will discuss best practices of local government units in terms of disaster recovery. Um, your presence here today, um, the overwhelming I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, unit in charge of this, um, signifies how important this topic is. Um, we would all think that since we have, what, on the average 20 typhoons every year, we have, what, El Nino every year. Five years, we have um, La Nina as well, we have volcanic eruptions that, you know, given the frequency of these disasters, we should be prepared by now um, to cope with all of this. And yet, I think there's still some challenges as what our speakers will, um, will share with us today. We hope that with your active participation in today's forum, we can provide input <coughs> in helping the country create an effective, an effective disaster risk reduction and management today. So, um, thank you, Dr. Reyes. So let me give you a brief introduction of our first speaker. He is a senior research fellow here at PITS and his research interest include disaster risk management, agricultural science, and resource economics and applied mathematical programming. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Sunny Domingo.
Okay, so well, I entitled the presentation DRRM Institution and Public Expenditure Review. It's a very general uh, uh, title for this presentation, and really, it's going to be reflective of how broad uh, the coverage will be. But uh, essentially, we are talking about institutional platforms. We're talking about institutional uh, collaboration in terms of DRRM, as well as how the government has been funding work towards uh, disaster risk management. So as uh, just uh, again to refresh us how important the RRM is, we all know that we are very, very prone to natural hazards. So recently, we've been encountering so much uh, human-induced disasters that uh, I think that aspect of us encountering every year so much natural disasters has been uh, put aside in a way. But uh, really, we're going to look at uh, the landscape in terms of us suffering, in terms of us being exposed to risk. We have so much, as you can see from this slide, floods, landslides, storms, typhoons, volcanic eruptions, all of, we all have those. And at the, at the global landscape, we are among the top in terms of uh, exposure to those risks. So just looking at, for example, uh, well, a representation of how we are exposed to hazards. You have there the Philippines having one of the biggest circles. So really, comparatively, compared to other uh, nations in the world, we are very much at risk. And I guess in terms of effort, we should have commensurate effort in terms of us trying to be more resilient, trying to, to prepare for eventualities. Again, the Philippines uh, showing in, in the world map of risk. Very high in terms of risk. In terms of ranking, top three worldwide in terms of uh, highest risk. Top three as well in terms of exposure. But uh, in terms of coping capacity, we seem to be unranked. Meaning we are uh, in a positive light, quite resilient. So we may be in, uh, we may be encountering so much disaster event year after year. We may be among the top uh, nations being exposed to natural hazards as well as human induced hazards. But uh, in terms of coping ability, I guess it's a testament to how good Filipinos are, how positive we are in terms of us trying to recover, in terms of us trying to cope. So I guess uh, whatever institutional platforms we have for DRRM or even for climate change adaptation, these are really just to augment what we have innate within the population. The Filipinos are very, very resilient on their own. But uh, we all need uh, augmentation in terms of coping ability, in terms of also interventions from those in the position to help. Just uh, another slide as an overview. So you have the estimates of damages, affected areas, affected people. Just uh, again to stress that we are very much affected by natural hazards as well as uh, human induced uh, disasters. But I'm sure you are quite aware of uh, our umbrella policy on the RRM as well as climate change. But really, if you're going to look back and if you're going to compare how we have progressed over the years in terms of us crafting that policy uh, for DRM and for climate change adaptation and mitigation, we've been quite lagging prior to 2010, prior to 2009. So um, right now, it's very, very commendable that we're doing a lot. Uh, in terms of the policy landscape, in terms of us being dynamic policy-wise, uh, and in terms of us really putting in so much resource to DRMCC, 
But uh, over the years, we're going to look back. We've been a bit lagging uh, behind in terms of the paradigm that we have been uh, using, in terms of the models we have been using, in terms of the approach that we have been using. So the slide presents to you a very simplified version of how we have progressed over the years. In terms of us looking into DRM, in terms of us looking into hazards, in terms of us looking into climate change. So you have there below paradigms um, focusing on hazard, vulnerability, resilience. And looking at the Philippines, you have there that we just really started augmenting our policy landscape around uh, 2010, 2009, when we had the Climate Change Act, 2010, when we had the DRRM. But the world has started uh, such a revolution in terms of um, the paradigms that we, we used to look at DRN and climate change, or hazards or risks uh, in general. Again, that, that figure um, is very much relatable. If we're going to look at what we've been doing at the national level, and even at the local levels, We've been doing a lot recently, and I guess you guys being part of the frontliners probably, or part of those institutions really involved in DRM or grounded initiatives of the field, you really recall that uh, prior to um, the late 2009-2008, uh, we've been really uh, doing this uh, in this field. But now, in terms of funding, in terms of policy backing, in terms of uh, even local governments focusing on DRM and climate change, you can see those. So we have a very, very good landscape right now in terms of policy, in terms of even grounding policy. Although we've been seeing a lot of uh, gaps, a lot of weaknesses in terms of uh, the institutional aspect, as well as processes involved in, in grounding policy, but the effort is there, the initiatives are there, and really everything is positive, we just have to do better. <coughs> so, uh, the current uh, institution platform that we have is, we have the NGOC, an ad hoc body composed of so many institutions, and around 44 members, and then we have the network for disaster risk reduction and management. And MC, the regional disaster risk reduction manage, management councils, provincial councils, city councils, municipal councils, and barangay uh, development committees. Now, the direction that we're looking at really is to have a more uh, concrete structure for DRM and climate change adaptation. Now, I think that's that's a good uh, pathway towards realizing. Uh, a more responsive um, national government, as well as a more responsive institutional partners uh, toward climate change adaptation and disaster risk management. What you have in your right uh, screen is really an interpretation of what Congress has been doing right now, uh, trying to craft uh, a bill, creating a new institutional platform for disaster risk reduction management. It's not a formal uh, structure from, from Congress or from those who have uh, uh, prepared the bill or the amendatory bill, but it's a representation of uh, what they want to have. So they want to have a very, very strong institutional platform, a super body really, composed of so many uh, institutions that are currently operating uh, quite independently. So. Looking at the landscape, looking at how institutions work right now, you see a lot of divisions when we discuss climate change and when we discuss disaster risk management. Now, the new uh, policy direction really is to have a more integrated approach um, to CC and DRR. And I guess that's a very, very uh, intuitive way of going uh, forward. It's not, the, it's not the government or the national government agencies doing their own thing. It's really us, uh, the whole of government, working towards resiliency, considering climate change and disaster risk. So um, I guess what, what can take home from, from that slide 
Ladies, we need to augment structure. We need to augment institutional platforms, and we need to augment processes within institutions. <coughs> Quite easy to say, but very, very difficult to grab. It's like us coming up with the umbrella programs for, well, the umbrella policies for climate change and disaster risk management, as well as national programs for climate change adaptation and disaster risk management. So we have those, but really in terms of us translating those very, very comprehensive documents into groundable initiatives, perhaps within localities, it's a totally different thing. And I guess uh, just realizing that we have that gap, and if you go around and ask people working within the DRM uh, sector, they will be one in saying that we can do better. Although we have that very, very good uh, policy landscape right now, we have a very, very comprehensive set of national plans. In terms of us grounding, in terms of us translating those plans into uh, sectoral as well as local uh, roundable plans, we are a bit lacking or we are a bit weak. There are certain uh, localities that are quite strong, that are quite progressive, and I guess those uh, examples are worth emulating, worth uh, multiplying in terms of other localities um, adopting the same processes, the same decision-making uh, protocols, the same standards for the area and climate change. So just uh, for you to, to, to see the totality, how we ground uh, policy. So you have there the fiscal framework and uh, the social economic development plans, as well as the investment programs um, indicated at the national, regional, provincial, and local levels. So we have right now a new BDD, a major term uh, development plan for the Duterte administration. And it's, it's really at the top. But then you also have national uh, plans based on the uh, umbrella programs, umbrella, umbrella policies for DRR and climate change. And those are translated supposedly at the regional, provincial, local level. We're going at uh, the very, very forefront of, of uh, the battle with uh, disaster risk. You go to the localities. You see there that there are two major documents that they are using. These are the group and the CTPs. So the Comprehensive Land Use Plan and the Comprehensive Development Plan. These are two major documents actually detailing the landscape for, for how the municipality or how the locality will move forward. And when you're talking about uh, mainstreaming disaster risk management and climate change adaptation, you're talking about CC and DRR are being part of these two major documents. But uh, there are complications, and, and uh, there are complications, and later on I'll be trying to touch on those. Just like everything else that we have on the table, uh, they are not as simple as uh, they look. There are so many intricacies when you go down uh, to the field. And there are so many variables, there are so many differences in terms of capacity as well. So we may have a very, very conducive landscape. We may have a very, very good structure. We may have a very, very good institutional platform, but really capacitating everyone involved, especially those in the front line, is a must, and that's uh, primary. So just to to map again how policy has evolved in the Philippines. For so long, we had BB 1566, the Disaster Coordinating Council, as uh, our uh, major uh, policy for disaster risk management. Everything changed when we had, well, not really changed, but uh, the policy became more augmented when we had the 2010. Uh, the RRM Act. But really, if you're going to look at it, you're still talking about the same institutions, the same actors being part of that network. But the outlook is different. Proactivity has been highlighted. And really, a more comprehensive approach has been put in place. 
Now, uh, I guess that's kudos to, uh, to all those who worked on that national policy as well as on the national plan for DRM. But uh, the bigger task really was translating that into countable maps at the local level, at the regional level, at the provincial level. So aside from national uh, policies, we have commitments internationally. And I guess right now, um, in terms of climate change, we have the NDCs, the National Determined Contributions, which uh, if you're going to look at uh, the highlight of that, our commitment uh, to reduce emissions by 70%. That's quite huge, uh, but it has uh, premises so our commitment has to be uh, based on the uh, support we'll be getting internationally as well. So I guess ECC has been working on that. And I guess last month, just last month, they've been working on the recommended technologies that we uh, have funded by the international bodies. Okay, we'll go to um, public investment of the on DRRM. So you have here to define just detailedly how we have augmented our resource for accessibility management over the years. It's quite positive that we've been getting so much uh, in terms of augmenting uh, resiliency initiatives. This is a national fund, but there are quick response funds being uh, directly downloaded to institutions involved in DRF. So over the years, they've been changing that. Uh, in 2012, they only had, I think, five. And they've been changing the institutions receiving QR over the years. I don't know the basis for, for such changes, but uh, I think it's an indication that we've been uh, quite dynamic in terms of response. But in totality, if you're going to look at uh, funding for DR, it's really the SWD that's been getting the biggest slice of the pie. And rightfully so, because they are the culture for response pillar of uh, disaster management. <coughs> In terms of the climate change budget that we have, you have there also an increasing trend from 2016 to 2018. It's quite, well, it's, it's a bit easier to actually look at climate change funding since uh, we have this arrangement between CCC, the ILG, and TBM uh, about tagging climate change expenditure. It's not present with DRM, so it's not being done for its as uh, management related expenditures. So this one is quite direct in terms of how you look at it. They started in 2015, so the graph below, um, they tried to map backwards how we were funding climate change initiatives. And as you can see, it's been rising. So it's a good trend. We've been giving also much more in terms of climate change uh, funding. So in terms of uh, where we are spending uh, those resources, we have water sufficiency as number one. We have food security as well, and sustainable energy as the three major areas being funded under climate change. For the local disaster risk reduction management fund, now this is uh, the 5% uh, era allocation for local governments. And they have this for disaster risk reduction and management. It's divided into 70, 30, 70 you can use uh, quite flexibly. 30 as quick response fund as well. So in times of disasters, you have that standby fund. Again, if you're going to look at the graph from 2011 to 2017, it's a positive indication that we have been giving more to our localities for them to spend on disaster risk management. This is a more detailed uh, accounting of, of how the fund has been distributed throughout the regions that we have. And uh, interestingly, you have the region 4A, region 3, as uh, 
those really kept in so much um, local disaster risk reduction management. It's a bit ironic uh, if you're going to look at issues of equity because of, well, a lot of our poorer municipalities or localities need more funding. But then, this is based on your era, so 5% of that, the more, the more progressive uh, localities get more in terms of resources. So that one, I guess, has to be looked into, their implementing policy. In terms of uh, institutional funding as well for ERM, you see there uh, three graphs. To your right, uh, on top, you see the DRRM tag expenses, and we're going to aggregate everything. A lot of our DRRM expenses are towards human security and knowledge and capacity building. So compare this with what uh, has been uh, delivered for climate change adaptation and mitigation, which is water sufficiency, sustainable energy, and food security. So I guess that's very rational in terms of us trying to allocate resources. And really, maybe it's not really just an institutional divide between climate change and the RRM. Maybe they really have their own spheres of, of uh, um, realm to work within. Again, it's the funding. You have the idea that we receive it so much for disaster risk management. The OST is quite mobile in terms of it moving towards climate change initiatives and disaster risk management because they've been working on mitigation prevention uh, technologies. I guess that's very common between the two. And I guess that's a point of overlap in many ways in a positive light. So again, well, we only have 20 minutes to present, so I'll be just going through everything quite quickly and quite uh, generally. So key issues. Again, if you're going to look at the national, the regional, and the local levels, you'll see a lot, a lot of issues to, to address in terms of climate change, in terms of disaster risk management. But um, we can really only try to simplify how we view things and how we try to address them. So in this case, we have divided uh, issues into policy and planning, leadership coordination, implementation, budget uh, allocation and expenditure, monitoring and evaluation. So in terms of um, policy and planning, as I mentioned earlier, we have very, very good uh, umbrella policies for the RM and CC, as well as national plans for, for those two. But really, in terms of translation, we have that weakness. Major to long term nature of groups and CDPs complicating climate change and the RR mainstream. We've been talking about trying to mainstream disaster risk management and climate change adaptation. But we're going to, for example, uh, visit all the, the local governments that we have and try to see whether they have done this. It's, it's quite a different story. Uh, we've been pushing towards them adopting that. Uh, that uh, mainstream, mainstream approach towards uh, addressing risks. But if you're going to look at the two major documents that they have right now with them, which is the group and the CDP, a lot of them will fail if you're going to be objective in assessing. In terms of those two documents containing the tenets of the RM and climate change. So that's one aspect. And then again, if you're going to look at the annual uh, investment programs of those localities. It's another story again. So your, your AIPs have to be based on what you have with you, your, your thematic plans as well as your CDPs and groups. But uh, you're going to be strict in terms of reviewing AIPs of localities. You'll be surprised that there are so many discrepancies. They're not really funding what they are supposed to fund. So that's, that's quite sad a very sad part of the story. The good thing is we've been doing more 
terms of them being augmented capacity wise in crafting documents the CPP step loops uh, mainstreaming those climate change plans as well as the RR plans in those two major documents as well as them really having those key items in their investment plans so that's the manifestation of them really mainstreaming uh, climate change and the RR for the RR there is that five percent for climate change there is not but we have the tagging arrangement for climate change so they've been reporting expenditures on climate change but not on disaster risk management. Although there are mechanisms for, for reporting disaster risk management expenditure, but not in a very structured way. So there, there, there is that uh, irony. You have a very defined source of funding for DRM of the local governments, none for climate change, but there is that expenditure tagging arrangement for climate change that's very, very good. And they have been complying in terms of submitting those figures. So I guess that's an avenue for, for intervention on our part, on the part of the national government as well. So with integration of CC and DRM loops and CTPs, we can turn to long-term nature of loops and CTPs. That's another issue. It's not just local governments, they're biasing their loops and CTPs. These are medium to long-term documents. And they revise it from six to 10 years. So you have that window, really, to work on those uh, mainstreaming uh, arrangements for CCNDRR, so including the tenets of climate change and disaster risk management, uh, would take a very, very uh, elongated uh, engagement on their part. Leadership and coordination, too much dependence on ins individual institutional leadership. That's, I guess, uh, also been said so much, so many times. And I guess even Congress has been going towards that augmentation in terms of leadership. That's why they've been crafting this big deal. But really, we have a very good policy. We have a very good national plan. But the approach that we've taken has been individual in so many ways. So institutions with their very, very good leaders doing their own thing. What's good is we have an umbrella policy, an umbrella program that actually covers almost everything. So even them not coordinating, for example, their own institutional initiatives, a lot of those will fall under the umbrella pro program or umbrella plan that we have at the national level. Okay, frequent uh, turnover of uh, leadership, not only at the national level, but also in local governments. So continuity in terms of their plans, their flagship uh, initiatives, institutional divide between key implementing agencies of CC and DRR. Really, we're talking about almost the same institutions, but uh, there's that institutional divide in terms of approach. Um, I don't know how to how to uh, expand that uh, discussion, but I guess all of you uh, intuitively even just by hearing that, know what I'm talking about. So, um, we see CDR are interagency coordination. Lack of clarity of institutional roles and functions. So that's another thing. So really a weakness in terms of coordination, in terms of institutional arrangements, institutional collaborations. Implementation of mandates. Okay. Institutional um, primary mandates versus CC and DRR responsibilities. So a big thing, we're talking about institutions with, with their own mandates. All those 40 plus institutions uh, forming NDMC have their own specific mandates. We've been tapping AFP uh, as warm bodies in terms of responding to disaster events, but it's not their primary mandate. We've been using the material resource of DPWH for clearing roads, addressing so many disaster-related uh, events, but it's not really their primary mandate as well. So um, I guess having that thought towards giving more investment on a structure that's very concrete institution-wise, as well as a structure that would be able to amass resource and assets toward DRM and climate change adaptation is a very, very positive way to move forward. 
inequitable resource distribution among institutions and LGUs. I mentioned that earlier. Need for human resource capacity and number augmentation. So under the law, uh, LGUs are supposed to have material positions for, for DRM offices. Unfortunately, not all uh, local governments are able to fund and so, ma and so many officers working within DRM are really just appointees with different uh, plantilla positions. Budget allocation and expenditure reporting. Unclear source of the 5% in allocation of LGUs. We've been saying repeatedly that you have 5% of your era for, for local governments. But uh, talking, for example, DOF, DLGF, they said that what's the basis of that 5%? Is that an actual figure or the estimated value of your era? So those are two different things. Relative value of uh, the era allocation, given uh, the different uh, revenues of localities, inability of LGUs to maximize the utilization of CC and DRR. He's saying that uh, we need augmentation in funding, but really a lot of our local DRRM funds are not being used. So they can use this for, for five years, goes into a trust fund. But uh, why not use it now? Maybe. Because we encounter so much uh, problems year after year, and uh, I guess the resources that we have now can be really put into good use. Why not wait five years? Why wait five years or three or four to use it? Lack of mechanism for checking status of fund requests. This is uh, a thought aired by uh, our local government counterparts. They can request funding from the national DRM fund, but uh, really the feedback mechanism is needing a bit of augmentation as well. Even the regional office of uh, OCT is unable to answer, for example, whether a request from below has been funded. So that's that's a big uh, gap that we have to address. It's really us having that very, very good structure towards uh, relaying information, communicating, and feedback. Unclear priorities absence of tagging mechanisms for DRM. And clear priorities, uh, well, if we're going to look at sectors, for example, um, a very, very interesting input from Region 8 that we got uh, is that they've been trying to really focus on um, a sectoral approach to capacity augmentation rather than focusing on local governments. So that's a totally different paradigm, I guess, and that's going to also entail so much institutional arrangement that's different from what they're doing now. So that's a different animal compared to what they're used to, to see in right now. Another complication, but I guess it's, it's, it's got its uh, positive uh, aspect. We're going to look at uh, really going down uh, to the field and, and addressing genuine concerns of real people. So absence of tagging mechanism, I've mentioned earlier, you have that for climate change, you don't have that for DRM. It's a big gap, you have to address that. They've been reporting climate change expenditures, and I guess it's overlapping in so many ways with DRM expenditures. So if you're going to have a separate mechanism for tagging DRM expenditures, you have to define specifically which to cover in those reports. So monitoring and evaluation, we reporting lack of information sharing among agencies, lack of indicators for resilience, absence of a mechanism for identifying gaps, technical assistance, lack of coherence in policies by concerned agencies. So guidelines for reporting. We have so many uh, interagency guidelines. We have so many agency uh, memorandums that. Uh, if you talk to people on the ground, there are still so many chaotic answers, so many uh, unexplained answers as well. Uh, so there is 
um, a witness in terms of how we are relating policy, in terms of how we are communicating policy, and how we are understanding policy at the ground level. And that has to be addressed. So ways forward, stronger institutional platform, I guess uh, Congress is working on this right now. Institutional capacity and process augmentation. We all have to be augmented capacity-wise. Not only in terms of our human resources, but also in terms of how we do things, how we um, decide on key issues uh, related to ERN and, and uh, climate change. APCC and ERR inclusion in fiscal frameworks and socioeconomic plans and investment programs. So this is really that uh, complete manifestation of policy grounding. We don't see CCC uh, see and BRR in the clubs, in the CDPs, in the AIPs of localities, and there's no mainstreaming happening for climate change and disaster risk management. Monitoring and evaluation of plans, programs, activities, and projects, expenditures, that's a must. Even just the actual inventory of DR and resources or assets, we really don't have that. So yes, um, we keep on saying that we have to augment the resources, we have to give more to DR and to CC, but having that very basic information as to how we are in terms of the level of assets we have for climate change adaptation and disaster risk management, we don't have that, we can't answer that. And that's a big gap. And then lastly, CC and DR integration. So that divide that we see institution-wise, implementation-wise, is quite evident, and it has to be addressed. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Domingo. So. Um, after the, the speakers uh, present, with, uh, after the presentation, we'll just entertain the your questions. Okay. So, um, for the second, our second um, resource speaker is an assistant professor at the University of the Philippines School of Economics. She is also the program director of the USA Grant Energy Policy and Development Program at the at the UP Econ Foundation Incorporated. Her research interests include energy economics, economics of natural disaster, resource economics, and development economics. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Mahmoud Rabato. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, first, of, first of all, I'd like to thank the IDS, um, Dr. Celia Reyes, for having us here. Um, we welcome this opportunity to present outside of the academy because of the topic. So we really um, would like to hear your opinions um, with regards to this because this is really geared more on um, the practitioners and um, the policy makers. Uh, I hope some of you, probably some of the audience here, um, are the ones that we have interviewed. So I'd like to again thank you for accommodating us when we are when we were doing the survey. Okay, so. Um, so this is a paper that um, that we are doing. Um, the other um, one of the co-authors is here, Jason Lau, that I'm doing with um, Dennis Mapa, the Dean of School, School of Statistics, and James Runaset um, from the University of Hawaii. So we're looking at um, how to cope with disasters um, due to natural hazards, and we're looking at the evidence from the Philippines. Um, what I'm presenting today is actually uh, uh, the results of the survey that we did uh, among local government units. Before this, uh, we already did a survey among the households. So after this study, what we eventually want to do is to marry them. So what I'm presenting to you is just part of the bigger um, research agenda that we have in mind. Okay. So you have already seen this from the presentation of Dr. Domingo. Um, Philippines based geographical location. Um, the country is prone to natural events of extreme intensity. 
So we have to differentiate disaster from a natural event of extreme intensity. We often hear um, typhoon occurring in the Pacific, but if it doesn't you know, affect any population, then it's just a natural event. It's not a disaster yet. So it becomes a disaster when there is already a suffering or a um, tremendous shock to the population. So we have to differentiate that. And um, as also shown by um, Dr. Domingo, we have this uh, mentioned by Dr. Celia Reyes earlier, we know that the Philippines, by its geographical location, we often experience typhoon, about 20 on average. And increasingly, I think in the recent years, we see an increase in the frequency and also in the intensity. Um, flooding also occurs in a number of regions, so it's shown in the map, and we, all, we also have volcanic eruptions. Um, and also, from time to time, we have um, um, volcanic um, eruptions, such as the Mount, Mount Pinatubo that we have experienced in the 1990s. So for this particular um, research, um, what we ask is how can public policy be designed to balance the available ex-ante and ex-post controls to maximize expected economic welfare? or mostly from um, the economic discipline. So the objective is always how to improve welfare of the people, so economic well-being. Um, so um, what we ask also is how can public interventions mediate in the adaptation? So um, for this particular paper, uh, we're focusing on disaster caused by hydrometeorological hazards. So we're only um, limiting the study for now to strong winds and rains. So this is our, these are disasters caused by strong winds and rains, flood, landslides, and big waves. In the survey, we, do, uh, we also ask other forms of um, natural hazards, such, such as, um, I think, biological hazards. But for this particular analysis, we want to focus only on these hydrometeorological hazards and excluding those that are caused by volcanic eruptions. Because the idea is you have to have a different analysis for these um, uh, most frequently occurring these ha um, hazards versus volcanic eruption, which is less frequently occurring and also has a low probability of occurring. The analysis will have to be different. So for this um, paper, we are focusing only on this. So um, you may already be familiar with this, but we're trying to um, um, understand you know, what are the different public policies um, that is being done to reduce household vulnerability. Of course, it has to be grouped depending on the occurrence of a particular disaster caused by hazards. So you can see here, uh, we have here on the timeline before, during, and after the disaster. And it's actually um, legend by colors. So those dark greens would be the ones done by the government, or these are public actions. Um, the ones in red are um, done by the household. The, the maroon one would be the household ex-ante coping strategies or risk management strategies. And the one in pink, uh, I guess that would be the household exposed coping strategies. So household do it after they experience a disaster and the red ones before they do it, before uh, they experience a disaster. And on the green one, or yellow green one, would be um, the public actions that complements the ex ante activities done by the households. So I'm not going to dwell on each of this. Um, you, you, have, you have your handouts with you. So that, 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 that's how we classify um, these different public policies. So in reviewing the literature on the science of disaster management, uh, we noticed that um, most of the studies or the literature dealing with this, the attempts to identify strategies based on the downside, meaning after experiencing the disaster. But, experience, but an event or natural hazard happening, it's a chance. We don't know whether it's going to happen or not. Although for some um, natural hazards like typhoon, we have some idea that they will pass the Philippines 20 times a year. Okay, so. So meaning um, there is not proper attention to the upside because we are preparing in the event that it's gonna happen, but we are happy if it doesn't happen. So there's, there is no attention to that positive side. So it fails to fully account, most of the studies uh, fails to fully account for interdependencies between the many instruments of risk management and coping strategies. 
Interdependencies meaning they interact with each other. And depending on how much you do, that would influence how much you will be exposed to a particular uh, natural hazard. So um, Alexander, in his paper, noted that the field of disaster management, as it is, is kind of ad hoc and full of ambiguities. So, um, so what we need is a coherent framework for um, integrating this risk reduction and coping strategies and allowing for the upside, like what I've said, as well as the downside. So here is our attempt to develop this kind of general framework on how we think about risk management strategies. I'd like to take some time in um, explaining this framework because, like what I've said, the audience is composed mainly of practitioners in the field of disaster management. Um, okay, so we start with uh, the oval one. So it's orange. So this is the event, something that we cannot do. It's an it's something that we cannot influence. It's an exogenous event. So this is the um, the climate. We cannot do anything about it unless probably a global actions like climate change. But if a small country like the Philippines, we cannot really um, make a dent. In this, in this regard. So we take it as an exogenous, something that is given. And then the nature would be the one to give the resulting probabilities. Okay, so that's the one. So all the squares, these are something that we cannot do or something that um, exogenous are given. And the ovals are the actions taken at different stages. So the first stage, okay, the first stage of adaptation, this one, the first oval, would be the actions taken by both the public and the private sector. So this is the initial stage of adaptation. So for example, zoning, um, um, constructing seawalls. So depending on the extent of your infrastructure, that would give you now a resulting distribution of what would be exposed, the extent of flooding, for example. So that would depend on the actions taken on the first stage, okay, and then comes the second stage of adaptation. That would be when um, right before the disaster happens or right before a natural hazard happens, you would give that same early warning and response. Okay, so again, the resulting um, distributions after that actions would determine um, given what you did on that second stage of adaptation. And then after that, so it's an oval again, people would respond and act. For example, we see people um, when, when an LGU said it's time to evacuate. You don't really see people evacuating because they don't want to leave their houses. And that's when um, this exposure, uh, exposure to damage and um, injury would occur because they don't want to hit um, the uh, early warning and response. Okay. So then again, nature would determine the extent of damage given what you did on the first and second stage of actions on the level of actions. And then come the um, relief. So this is again the, if you think about the build back better, this would be where the first stage of building would come. So public and private relief efforts would deal with the injury and distress coming from the resulting um, um, damages here on the yellow, uh, on the yellow rectangle. Then, um, vulnerability really, the concept of vulnerability, it's really a characteristic of the frequency distribution coming from the initial stages of actions that both the private sector and the public sector did. Okay, and then um, again, nature would determine damage. So again, take note of the difference between damage and damages. Damage would actually refer to losses, death, injury, and distress and damages refers to the compensation. So there is that subtle difference. Okay, and then comes the bouncing back. This is where coping um, after the natural hazard or the disaster from the natural hazard happens. And then comes the resilience. Resilience, again, this is a characteristic of the resulting distribution. So, and then it's the nature really that selects the final outcome that we experience after a disaster happens. So if you, this is, Kind of very complex framework, if you, if you think of it. So if you watch um, Infinity War, if there's the scene where Doctor Strange is looking at the many possibilities, you think of it like that. 
because depending on what you do here, that would determine these actions, right? And then you also have several options here that would determine another permutation. So there are many possibilities. But what's important as we um, develop and, and craft policies is that we know this framework so that that will guide us. So it's very complex um, because at each stage that you make decisions, there's a lot of uncertainty, right? And we only have enough we only have limited resources. So where do you put your peso to such investment? Okay, so we need to know the probabilities of the various states of the world. So that's why science is important. Because that would give us, you know, the idea when a disaster would happen and where would we use our peso to make the investments in preparation for such hazard. Okay, so nonetheless, um, what we need is try to make the problem simple. So Einstein said, everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. But we need to know the general framework to be able to craft appropriate policies. Um, following the basic tenet in economics, um, we just follow the marginal expected benefit of each action should be equal across different stages of decision making with regards to um, disaster management. So that's what we are um, attempting to do in this um, agenda, in this uh, research. So um, one simplification would be to know the history. The history because um, it would teach us like, the, uh, like when the events, the frequency of events happen. So that would be one simplification. Or one simplification would be to assume that we know for certain that such an event would happen given our prior knowledge of the experiences before. So that would be uh, uh, one way to make um, the framework simpler and make it operationalized. Um, so we did this survey um, to gather data from the experiences of the local government unit. Um, this survey is actually, the study is funded by the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs of the University of the Philippines. I have to mention that. Uh, we conducted this survey in November 2016 and so April 2017, and then another one from September to October 2017. There was a gap because when we were doing the survey, Marshall happened. So we cannot go to Mindanao. We made it last. So then Marshall happened. So we have to um, adjust. No, we cannot go to um, the highly least provinces. Um, because martial law has been declared, so we had to adjust and replace those municipalities. Um, the purpose for the survey is to investigate each shocks caused by natural hazards. Um, these are hazards experienced by municipalities and how these municipalities um, employ different risk management strategies. So we have eight shocks, but for this paper, we're focusing only on the four shocks, the hydrometeorological um, hazards. So we use a multi-stage sampling design with a nationally representative um, sample from 47 provinces. So we have about 193 municipalities and covering the different um, risk areas. So we had the data from, I think, Project NOAA, depending on how they classify provinces and even the municipalities according to high, high risk and low risk. So we, we wanted to make it nationally representative and also representative on where they are located. So that would be our sample, 193 municipalities. Okay, and then of course we had to develop our, our survey instrument. The survey instrument is based on the framework that I just described here earlier, covering the different stages of adaptation, um, whether they are building seawalls or not, um, and, and the, their experiences on um, with the eight, eight natural hazards. So that's how we did it. Um, and like what I said, this is already the second survey that we did. So the, the samples for the LGU and even the, um, the survey instrument are more or less at par with the sample and survey instrument that we did for the household. Because what we eventually want to do is to marry this, meaning look at the interactions of both the public actions and the private actions. But for this one, we're only focusing on the actions taken by the local government units. Okay. So 
we had data on the initial conditions. I think you have that in your um, handouts, but I'm not going to show that anymore in the interest of time. So, but we have data in addition to the survey on the population, poverty incidence, revenues and other income, and even the political density in the um, municipalities. Um, all of these are taken from PSA, but the political density data, these are the data generated by the AIM Pathway Center. So we connected that with our own survey data. So in the survey, we asked the respondents, so in this case, uh, the 193 respondents, these are the green office of LGUs. So all of, most of all over the country. So we defined shock in the survey as um, unforeseen adverse events or disaster due to natural hazard that can lead to a decrease in welfare. So we have to make them understand that what we're asking is the hazard that they experience that cause you know, a decrease in welfare such as death or damage in their infrastructure. Because they might respond, yes, we experience um, flooding, but it's just a normal flooding. So it should, it, it, that would not be tagged as a shock. So again, the focus is on the four hydrometrological disasters. So here are some um, results of the survey. Um, the incidence or the number of uh, municipalities who said that they have experienced those hydro hydrometrological hazards is about uh, 189 out of the 193 municipalities that we have surveyed. Um, again, we expected this because these are the natural hazards that are more frequently occurring. Okay, so we expected it to be more. And we also asked how severe was the shock. So this is perception based. Based on the green um, officers, uh, they said that um, most said about 61% about of the municipalities in the 190 sample said they experienced very severe to most severe shocks. Okay, so yung naka yellow one, these are the total already for the four. And then, um, since this is perception based, right? So we ask them whether, um, the, what, what, how, how is the severity of the shocks that they have experienced? We validated it with external data, whether this, these are indeed severe shocks. So some validations that we did using um, storm signal, um, cyclone scale, and then the intensity and um, peak in terms of kilometer per hour of the, um, in this case, hydrometrological disasters. So we did find um, positive linear relationship. So more or less, the perceptions that the LGU respondents gave us coincides with the external measure. So we can count on it as um, truly being severe or most severe. Okay. So we also have um, the number of families affected by the most severe shock because we are interested in their recovery and how they were able to recover from the shocks. Those are the risk management. So in this case, um, the average, more or less, would be about 8,000 um, families uh, that were affected. And of course, this is the most important question. Has the municipality completely recovered after experiencing the shocks? Um, by the way, the recall period is up to, to, uh, from 2009. So from 2009, um, have you experienced any shock? Okay. So, and then we did this last year. So asking the question, has the municipality completely recovered? So their answer is about, um, in this case, 67% of the 193 municipalities said that they have already completely recovered from the shock. Okay. Now, this recovery, Okay, so in the literature, there are different types of recovery after experiencing a um, shock or a disaster due to natural hazard. Um, you will see here that after a disaster, there can be a case that the municipality do not recover at all. So this may be the case, let's say, in a country level, like what we see in the, the experience of Haiti. Okay, so people are saying that they haven't reached any um, or probably incremental recovery only. And then there's also a recovery to trend, meaning you go back to where you are before. Okay, and then the build back better recovery. And then the last one would be the creative destruction. So in the literature, this is in the 
um, the case at the macro level because when the, a disaster happens, um, you would replace existing capital that may be old but you don't want to dispose and then disaster happens. Then you would buy a new one which is more modern. And in one municipality, I think in Bohol, that in Bohol, um, their public market has been destroyed by the recent earthquake. And they're saying that they're now building a sophisticated public market. And we pass by it, and it's true, by the level of the public market that we see, it's actually very much modern. So that would be the case of creative destruction. But note here that in this recovery, evolution of recovery, it only tells us the, the slope, right? The rate of growth. But there can also be a case where the slope may change or the intercept. So meaning it may um, go up immediately after the, this, after the experience of that um, disaster. But again, that would depend on the actions taken, both by the public and by the private sector. Okay, so no, given this, we have a questions on the instrument asking what is the state of the recovery? Because they said they have completely recovered. Now, what is the state of the recovery? So in this case, 79% said that the state of recovery is better than before. So which is a lot of Okay. So now uh, we want to look at the different risk management activities. The COVID, the ex ante, and the ex post. So the different stages in our framework, right? So um, I have a bridge the slide, but in your handouts, um, for let we have different activities that would look at what would be their long-term precautionary measures, the mid-term precautionary measures, and the short-term precautionary measures. So you'll have that in your slides. And then in addition to this, uh, we also have um, the incidence of um, various risk management activities that they did after they have experienced. So, um, for example, in one of these, did you issue a warning or evacuation? Uh, did you issue an order of evacuation? Um, is there a presence of evacuation center designated for the shop? Okay. And then another one would be um, incidents of various risk management activities in terms of coping, meaning after. Um, undertaking operations, offered cash for work program, and so on and so forth. Now for each of these um, risk management activities, before and after, there are also several questions like how long did you did, how long did you do it, um, how many were involved, things like that. So in order to capture all those information for each one activity, uh, we combine it and develop indices so that we can capture that information. Okay, so um, what we did is we have um, indices for precautionary measures, long term, short term, and then mid term. We also have indices for rehabilitation and rebuilding. Okay, so for example, we have here what we call long term precautionary measures index. So this would be a weighted average of the, prod of the product of the type of long term precautionary measures. So those are the building dikes in zoning. Okay, conducted by the LGU before the shock occurred and its length of implementation. Okay, so to capture all those information, so we have several indices. So this would be, we have about 19 indices. So you can imagine that when we did the interview, it takes about one hour and a half because we have those several questions. So this indices, at what are, or the risk management indices is what we're going to use in the analysis to determine what influence recovery because we asked did you recover already. Okay. So so this is the empirical model. Um, it's just a um, simple logic. Okay. So on the left hand side you have whether the municipality have recovered or not. So it's just one and zero. So one meaning they completely recovered and zero is no partial recovery or no recovery at all. And then on your um, right hand side, that would be the all all of the ex ante and, and ex post risk management strategies. So those would be the 19 indices that we have developed based on the um, survey. Okay, and then we also have um, characteristics of the LGU such as the their income, the ERA. Um, their land tax revenue, their, also their local revenue, population, whether there is a uh, the extent of dynasty in the municipality. Okay, 
okay? So that's how, so we're trying to explain um, what is that inner recovery. Because we wanted to have uh, what is in the resilience in our general framework. So this is the full model. Okay, you may not see it, but we have it. Um, Dr. Dana is already complaining that it's not um, friendly for the seniors. Um, this one is the um, final model after looking at what really aids in the recovery. So the yellow ones are the ones that are coming out to be significant in explaining, in explaining the recovery. Now, of course, um, this is one study, you know, this is the numbers. It doesn't mean that all the others are less important. Okay, so the yellow ones are the ones that are coming out to be significant. So what matters in the recovery? Um, severity, um, lower chances of recovery. So the probability in this case decreases by 16 percentage points. Um, ex ante, so these are the um, before um, activities, so long-term precautionary measures, cleanup operations, assistance from others, lifeline services. So how do we explain the numbers in the results, given that our explanatory variables are indices? Right? We developed an index for the um, ex ante, uh, the risk management strategies. So note that in the index, the highest would be one and the lowest would be zero. So the way to interpret the numbers would be you look at an LGU, let's say the long-term precautionary measure index, right? Um, if their LP MPI is equal to zero, it means that they did not do anything of the various long-term precautionary measure index. They don't have zoning, they don't have constructing seawalls and all. Okay, but if an LGU did all those um, long-term precautionary measures, then their index would be, would be one because they did. So it's like perfect. So meaning the coefficient that we are seeing, the 90%, it means that for that LGU where they did everything, the increase in the estimated probability of recovery is about 19%. For the ones that would be all, because that's the one that's coming out to be significant. Um, for, for our index of cleanup operations, so again, you look at it, when an LGU did everything, uh, the probability of recovery is 48% relative to an LGU with, who did not do anything at all. So at, at the extreme, because our explanatory variables are all in the sets. And relief assistance from others, uh, probability of recovery is um, 31%. And this one is also interesting because we're also looking at power interaction. Um, an LGU with service interaction, so this would include power and water, um, if their index is equal to one, it decreases the probability of recovery by 27%, which is intuitive. Okay, so um, other characteristics matter. So we, we have the risk management um, activities and there's also the characteristics, right? So in this case, um, a one percentage point increase in the total revenues of an LGU increases recovery by seven percentage points. Again, this is intuitive because they would have the means, right? They don't have to go or ask the national government to probably for their relief operations because the municipality is relatively rich. So it increases their probability of recovery. Okay, and then the dynasty. So again, the data we got this from AIM. Um, a one percentage point increase in the dynasty share. So this is a measure uh, developed by uh, Professor Mendoza, who is now at Atene, um, where the LG is located decreases the probability of recovery by 74%. Okay, so this is interesting. As we go around interviewing the dream offices, especially in the Visayas, you can really see that the politics play in the role um, of distributing relief, you know, it's it's disaster. You, diba? So I'm sure you know, you all know the story. But nonetheless, it plays a role in the recovery of LGUs. So some concluding remarks: severity of the disaster matters. Most prominent risk management that we see are long-term precautionary measures, assistance from others, and cleaning up operations. Um, local revenue and political dynasty also matters in the recovery. 
Um, as a next step, as I've been saying, uh, what we want to do in the agenda of this research uh, is we want to com combine the LG level and household level risk management strategies. So we want to see the interaction because in the initial, before and after, during the disaster, right, um, there is an interaction of what the public and the private sector do. So, for example, um, household would not undertake cleaning of the dikes because they, it's a public good. Right? So how does the public actions and private actions interact? So um, what we're after is to improve welfare and to, be, to improve that resilience and decrease the vulnerability. So we want to do that and examine the risk management strategies for disasters due to geologic hazards. That's also another important area of research. What we're doing here is just hydro, right? So it's more frequent and high, pro high probability of occurring. It's also important to look at the geologic the volcanic eruptions. Less frequently occurring, but low probability of occurring every one in 100 years, like the Mount Pinatubo. Um, the political economy is also different because for this one, because it's more frequently occurring, more often you see mayors would invest in um, disaster management because the benefits accrue while they are still in office. You wouldn't see that in um, disaster due to geologic hazard because the benefits of investing in preparedness would accrue probably after they are not in office anymore. It occurs every 100 years. So that is also another um, research area that is important. So this is where we went. So if you see here that Bohol, because of earthquake, their office is just two trailer lang. That's the mayor of Bohol. But they're building a new municipal uh, mayor's office. Okay. And then of course you, this is Marikina. So you, you would also see the, the dream office depending on the level of income of municipality. You iba talaga parang ang lang. Water. That's the description. Okay, and then um, that's of course Bicol. So Stanila yung medyo advanced on disaster risk management. And again, we'd like to thank um, UP uh, OBPA for the funding. And we have several um, assistance from our researchers, Angie, Rika, and Kathy. Thank you. Gwenda at the back has the microphone. Okay. Oh, sorry, Toots. Um, Toots Albert of the IDS. I, you know, I, I started becoming interested in disasters partly because of my own experience uh, how many years ago. Uh, 2009, after the death of my mom, a month later, I was in Mar I lived in Provident Village, Marikina. I did it then. And of course, you all know uh, what happened in 2009. So after that, I decided never again will I stay in Marikina. <laughs> so I, I left and I transferred to Makati. And, uh, but which brings me to my question. I mean, I, I congratulate both speakers for very interesting uh, presentations. I'm just more interested now in, so what now should really be done to improve risk resilience, which is both at the individual level and also as far as the communities are concerned. Um, and, and clearly, at the, my, uh, would have first 
for maybe to Sunny. Have you have you also saw, seen the way the way LGUs are spending, let's say on on because right now every time there's a disaster, uh, the first eva the evacuation centers are always the schools. And and so the, 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 the problem there is that you know if the if the the community is unable to immediately get out of the uh, you know to to build to to, to you know to, to really having difficulties coping, then the, the schools will not be operating as they should, you know. So the question is, have you examined the, the way are, are, the, are the LGUs actually building new, new um, uh, places for as, as venues for uh, disaster uh, operations? Second, maybe as far as uh, mass is concerned, I mean, um, very interesting insights. I, I just wonder, though, again, would be, or, or maybe in some can, can answer this as well, which is, I mean, in other countries, there's always this risk pooling, uh, you know, insurance, as a, as a mechanism by which I, I know Pacific countries and also even Caribbean countries, they put together insurance and in case something really happens. But I'm not too sure, is, are LGUs doing that here? Is, is that is that a calamity fund, a, a risk pooling mechanism, or is it just not really a uh, oh, help? I'm not too sure about this, because I, for me, that, that seems to be the way by which you, the, the LGUs particularly can be able to make use of the funds more judiciously and, and uh, okay. so. Yes. Oh, thank you for for that uh, for those questions. For the first one, um, have we looked at LGU spending? Now, this is really a very good question because it's now the focus of a UNDP review, and we've been saying that there is that weakness on how we are doing things because for climate change adaptation, expenditures and public investments, you have that. Management. But for DRM, there is none. Although you have a very complete source of funding at the localities, they're not really tagging um, DRM expenditures. And that also means that uh, in terms of the typologies of the expenses, there is no standard uh, set or classification. So you're asking, for example, is do they have capital expenditures uh, on infrastructure? investing on new buildings for um, probably in some cases for education as well. We can answer that once we have a good tally arrangement for the RM comparable to what CSET is doing. And I guess uh, that's that's very viewable in, in, in the horizon because the NGAs that we've talked to are very aware of that gap. And the intervention or the initiative towards coming up with the same arrangement for the RM is, I think, uh, coming up. So let me postpone my answer to that question. Once we get uh, those fiscal uh, data regarding the RM expenditures. For this pooling, there is this, uh, well, part of the entering fund really is for um, insuring assets mostly with GSIS. So that's that's uh, that's one uh, DRM financing that we're looking at. But uh, in terms of LGUs actually shelling out funds for insurance, it's not happening in most localities, as far as I know. Yes, uh, I agree that uh, tagging the expenditure would be a great idea. So if, while we are doing the survey, um, this is just one municipality telling us that they have this um, era that has to be spent both on the preparations and when the disaster happens, right? So this is this is a municipality in Mindanao. And they said because they have to spend it, they have to buy in boat or rescue. But that's in Mindanao. The, the, the topography in Mindanao is different. So if you can identify, of course, Philippines, even though it's one country located in the Pacific, within the Philippines, iba iba din yung needs. So that's why it's important to have that tagging where these um, funds 
going to uh, risk management is going. Dapat naman medyo appropriate. Okay, now on the insurance, uh, we did have a question on that for the um, LGU, whether they are aware. Most are not aware. So of course, um, but I think there's only one municipality who have that they have insured the building with GSIS. Other than that, ang bilis pag section na yun, ang bilis ng interview namin kasi wala silang sagot. So because we wanted to ask whether they have um, claim in the insurance and they don't know nga if there's an insurance. So wala na. Another thing is loans. They also are not aware of the loans. And of course that would depend, their awareness would also depend on the income class of the municipality. Sabi ko nga, the other dream offices, Nandun lang sila, nasa parang trailer lang, even if yung nasa Manila. So it's not really given um, appropriate funding or attention in dream offices. Of course, some municipalities would have a very um, high-tech and modern technology, like yung sa Marikina. Meron talaga silang screen to monitor. So, yes ma'am? Uh, good afternoon. My name is Tugan Sakari. I'm a disaster risk financing specialist, currently engaged in an Asian development bank project in the Philippines. Um, I very much welcome the research. It's very, very timely. Um, I think just in the last week, um, looking at the weather, you know, it's, it's very real for us. And um, I'm very sorry for um, your experience. Um, yeah. um, in terms of insurance, the GIS is access. Some of the work that the Asian Fund has done, led by the Department of Finance, has found that sometimes, even though there are great capacities at the LGU, LGU level and willingness to move and assist after a disaster, there is a period of immediately after a disaster where it's very difficult to mobilize financing. Um, so I just want to bring your attention to, in response to that, the Department of Finance is in the process of designing a scheme very similar to those that you mentioned in the Pacific, in the Caribbean, and in Africa, where countries have got together and they establish a risk pool, which means that they end up insuring themselves in a very economical, effective way. And they do it not based on the traditional insurance. It uses satellite information to be able to trigger an insurance payout immediately. In the Philippines, it's being done at benefit from the diversification of weather across the Philippines, you will not likely have a tropical cyclone in Mindanao and in the north at the same time. You bring these cities together. Once established, strongly designed for it, once established, this will be the first in the world at a city level. And it shows a shift in thinking, recognizing that cities are the first responders in disasters, and it's important to empower them and strengthen them. I just wanted to contribute to that. Thank you for the information. We appreciate it. Yes. Yes, from Rappler. Hi, Luna uh, Puella, Agusi Payanina, the disaster amount of Rappler. Do you have data on the barangay level, how many of the 42,000 barangays have operational BDRMs? That's my first question. And then second question, um, it's good that you mentioned CDP group and uh, Annual investment plan. Do you have data on what percentage of the LGUs actually display this or make this available to the public? Okay, uh, the first question. Do we have operational barangay disaster risk reduction management councils? The answer there is it's a weakness in the current policy. Um, we have instituted Municipal DRR offices, provincial DRR offices, ET DRR offices. But for barangays, we retain the arrangement for barangay development councils as the ones who um, look into disaster risk reduction and management. So probably in terms of uh, policy augmentation, that's one thing to look at. That's one thing to augment. Um, the question may be trans uh, uh, transformed into how many BPCs actually are uh, sufficiently addressing the RM concerns? I don't know the answer there because we don't have um, but, uh, evidences right now to, to give you a definite answer. But that's a very, very good aspect to look at. Thank you. 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 Thank
and probably a very good class implementation in the future. Okay. Another question for the speakers. Any more questions? Yes, I see hands at the back. Good afternoon. I'm Bernard from Sanana, the specialist from Pugasa. Um, of course, uh, at first, I'd like to commend the two speakers. Uh, Dr. Ramadan and Dr. Domingo for very good research. Those findings are quite strong and, uh, and um, it, really, it really, really, really will help us a lot in, in further improving the service, especially in the government sector. My question I would wish to like to uh, ask uh, Dr. Ramadan. Um, uh, um, you said that some of your data have in terms of the shock, uh, one of those uh, aggregates, or I mean, this, this aggregate is the big waves now. But you have included among the tsunami for, for hydro uh, I would, I would uh, probably like to uh, uh, recommend or maybe comment that uh, maybe we should disaggregate the tsunami from storm search because tsunami is uh, a more of a geologic uh, phenomenon rather than a hydromet hazard so maybe that's, that could also be a fair. I guess that's all, thank you. Thank you for that clarification, sir. I saw one hand at the back. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Marie de Leon from the Health Emergency Management Bureau of the Department of Health. And I would like to thank and congratulate um, our, our two presenters a while ago. Um, sir, I'm, I'm really very keen on the key insights that you listed down. Unfortunately, we don't have, we're not able to, to track down the details of that. But um, as one of the concerns, I think not only of the Department of Health, is the institutionalization of uh, DREAM, particularly in our, in our institution, our agency. We are working towards institutionalization of our disaster risk reduction management uh, in health, uh, particularly focusing on four indicators, which are, if I may share, the DREAM age planning, um, organized and trained response team, commodities or logistics, and of course, the operations center. Uh, it is, um, we are all aware that at the locality, I mean at the local government units, we, as far as we are concerned, we don't have a specific person to, um, to be in charge. Like it is always a designation. I can speak for our department. So this is the reason why we would like to do something about this because um, it is not just response because we have the four thematic areas. And we do believe that uh, it sh sometimes because of um, other priorities of our local government units, uh, they are prone not to think about uh, other phases, just focus on the response. So if we have a person or uh, because all of this, we are also being assisted in terms of health resilience by SWILI uh, in terms of health governance. So if we, we have to really put our acts together, whether it's a national policy or whether these are, uh, this will have to go through legalities, I don't know how, but uh, this will all affect our work as uh, practitioners in DREAM. Um, at the same time, um, um, I, would, uh, I also have some questions if the second presenter, oh, 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 what, what do you mean by dynasty share? And uh, you said that the, the ones that were highlighted in yellow were the ones that are that were the most uh, frequent, or what's supposed to be um, more significant. I don't know if if this means that we will be uh, prioritizing priority, prioritizing those in yellow in terms of the focusing or the project. And then how do we go about uh, those listing? Thank you, Doctor. For the first question. Okay, uh, thanks again for that question. 
it's it's really uh, also quite interesting that we've been trying to push for continuity uh, in terms of those dealing with the RN. So this is applicable both at the localities and institutions. But for localities, we have policy backing, meaning um, it is really defined in law that they have to have plenty of positions for the RN. So those DRM officers have to have uh, permanent status in their appointments, not just designations. But for institutions dealing with DRM, it's another issue. I mentioned earlier that a lot of our initiatives, institution-wise, are based on progressive leadership. Now for the OH, I don't know uh, the status of your internal uh, DRM actions or initiatives. But for other institutions, for example, uh, take a look at Tempet. They established their own DRM office way back um, 2012, I think. So it's like that. It's, it's a bit fra uh, fragmented in approach. And I guess that's a weakness that we have in terms of grounding DRM policy. But uh, progressive leadership, and sometimes not progressive leadership, define um, the eventual outcomes in terms of institutions being able to address the RM concerns. So I guess that's a very valid issue. You have to have continuity. You have to have people who are capacitated that would remain there and continue contributing. Not uh, people who are very, very mobile in terms of appointment. And so you reinvest every time. That's a very, very big no in terms of uh, resiliency efforts. Thank you. Dr. Uh, may I just add to that one? That's really true, no? When we were interviewing the LGUs, it's only one, I think, who has the plantilla. And most of the time, they were just taken from other offices because they already have an ID. And all the other people working in the dream office would only have that job contract, JO, or contractor. So that is one issue that I guess capacity building. So of course it's not true for the high income municipality, pero most of the ones that we interviewed, that's the case. Okay, now for, for the question, um, with regards to dynasty, it's a measure that uh, was developed by Professor Mendoza and his team. So the dynasty share would mean that they have this concept of fat dynasty and then the thin dynasty. So the dynasty share would be the um, extent of, I guess, the families you know, holding a particular province for so long. Okay, but again, this is not a study about dynasty. We are just using that, um, relating that to disaster. So I refer you to their paper looking at the dynasty. And then with regards to the result, um, our result is taken to be an average. Okay, so the yellow ones is statistically significant, meaning statistically significant in leading the recovery of the municipalities. So again, we, we, we think of it, we only have a limited resources, right? So where do you put your money? So it can aid in the prioritization, but it doesn't mean that you don't do the other um, risk management strategies. You would know, um, again, your characteristics for your LGU. The study is on the average for the whole Philippines. Okay, so it can serve as a guide. So it doesn't mean that you're going to use this na ito lang ang larigyan ko ng um, funding or ng investments for the preparation. Some more questions? Yes, sir. Uh, Good mercy of, from the College of Public Health, uh, UP Manila. I would like to know uh, what are the gaps that uh, you saw in terms of uh, capability building of our responders? I ask this question because uh, we have a project in UP Manila and we're trying to come up with uh, some kind of simulation training for the DRM. Capacity building gaps. Okay. Um, I don't know the actual gaps in terms of us having people on the field who are capable of responding to certain uh, DRM events or disaster events. But uh, I know for a fact that uh, during these past few years, we've been trying to augment our uh, human resource capacity to deal with the big one uh, in terms of Metro Manila 
experiencing that projected shock. Um, in that case, actually, uh, for example, PTSC has been crafting programs for capacity augmentation. They now have a master's degree for one uh, dealing with disaster risk management and crisis management. Um, probably a very good thing to do in the future is to also add that in our inventory. Uh, in terms of capacity, how do we account for uh, warm bodies on the field who are able to cope, who are able to assist, who are able to implement the RM activities uh, effectively and efficiently? But now it's the same uh, answer that I will say if you're going to ask me about the level of assets we have for the RM. It's really a, a, a question that's quite difficult to answer. Sorry for that. side to that is institutions have been submitting reports to the central office or even to the regional offices of, of OCD. The weakness is we don't have that mechanism to process all those submitted reports. So you have there an archive of reports from institutions and even um, there are certain expenditures on the RN that are being report, reported to OCD as well as COA but these are not being processed uh, systematically. So I guess that's a weakness, and in terms of knowledge man management, that's a very, very good avenue for augmentation, for intervention. At UP, there's this newly instituted institute, the Resilience Institute. I don't know if somebody from the Resilience Institute is here. So it's um, an effort at the university level um, to check all the faculty in different colleges who are doing research related to disaster. So nakalista doon, and I think there will be an effort, I'm not sure, I mean, I, I listed there as a um, researcher in the UP who's doing research. Uh, if they are going to have a centralized repository, so that may be an idea. But that's only at the UP. Listening to the two presentations. 
and with Dr. Domingo, my interest is on the policy paradigm shift. Um, I wonder, I was, while you were explaining, I, I was thinking about the Philippine Development Plan, particularly on Chapter 20, uh, Ecological Environmental uh, Stability, which says that there is, there is going to be uh, a, a policy tool uh, stated there is the strategic environmental assessment. So I wonder if there, uh, if there is any indication of putting it in place already, uh, where integrating the integrated approach of CCA, uh, CCADRRM towards resilience could be brought about through such policy tool. Uh, for Dr. Ravago, uh, again, along uh, strategic environmental uh, assessment. Um, I wonder if it's possible that your coherent, coherent framework would really look also at uh, um, carrying capacities <coughs> of, let's say, major river basins as a factor in uh, uh, to consider in a coherent um, framework that you presented. Doctor, how would you like to answer first? That, that, uh, the, the framework that we presented is a general framework, so I think that could be accommodated because the, the actions taken, those are just examples, but that would depend on the type of uh, natural hazards, right? So depending on the hazard, that would be taken into account. Dr. Sam, first question. Is chapter 20, ecological integrity? Uh, when I was also part of that uh, body that deliberated the, uh, the crafting of that chapter. And what's good with PDP is that it's uh, with a programming uh, document. So it has a, with it an investment programming um, worksheet. That's not present with uh, what we have for the DRRM Act and its national plan. I don't know if it's going to materialize, but uh, if it's in the PDP, it has the um, the backing for um, allocation of resource, making it uh, very feasible to to have it actualized. I want to know status if if uh, it's happening. Okay, so from this point, yes. Hello, uh, my name is Svenja Dominski and I work in, in London in Britain. I work at the London School of Economics and I work a lot on disaster risk management and climate change. And first of all, you know, really great to be here and to, to listen to your research and it's, it's really interesting. And, um, I'm currently working here with colleagues from the ADB on this um, insurance pool for cities. So we're actually very interested in, in the work and the survey that you've been doing. So my first question would be, to what extent is that material available and, and accessible? And then um, you mentioned the UNDP is currently planning or already doing a survey. Can you maybe explain that a little bit more? Thank you. Um, to what extent the survey is available? Um, I, we will make it available, but since um, it's part of our research and it took us you know, one year to do it, let us first utilize it. Um, but um, I think the first survey, the, for the one for the household, is already available for the students of UP School of Economics because we, we are um, encouraging students also to do research on disaster. So that one is available. For this one, we're still um, finalizing and polishing the first paper. So, but of course we would be gladly um, share it because we, are, we want people to use it for research. And we actually want to do it in panel. If you're interested in funding, in funding the next survey, let's talk later. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Okay, for, for that uh, second question about UNDP funding this current initiative, uh, they are now actually into the process of conducting a public expenditure and institutional review for climate change and DRR. So that's ongoing and it's probably going to be completed by October or November this year. Okay. 
um, a lot of the scoping work that uh, has been done with that initiative uh, I mentioned earlier. So the initial talks with uh, national government agencies, initial talks with local government uh, officials, all of those uh, are informing the actual expenditure and institutional review. So hopefully, it gets done by uh, before the end of the year. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Jinel. I'm from Kids. Uh, now that we learned that uh, political dynasties affect our efforts to counter, uh, I mean, to advance recovery, do you have any recommendations? Uh, you know, to address it. And, and uh, conflict number two is uh, uh, what exactly, uh, how were you, how did you basically? Uh, uh, what you call this, uh, assign a certain municipality as having, as being uh, reigned by political dynasties. Okay, the study on dynasty, we did not do it. It's um, Professor Ron Mendoza. Um, the study also do not focus on dynasty, so I don't want to make any recommendation with regards to dynasty. I'm just relating it to the recovery when they experience natural hazards. Okay, so it's Professor Ron Spindoza's arena. He has a lot of recommendations on what to do with dynasty. I don't want to comment on that. Um, with regards to uh, uh, how did you classify? So they have the data uh, for this provinces or uh, what's the extent of dynasty uh, governance so whether it's flat dynasty so we attach it so we tag uh, our sample so that's how we use it we did not generate the data on dynasty uh, our survey is all about the risk management strategies of the municipality we use it as one of the characteristics of lgu together with the population poverty incidence um, those are the characteristics of the dynasty do you, do you have any way to operationalize the decreasing the probability? Do, do you have any way to uh, operationalize the probability, the 74% uh, probability in the decrease in recovery? I mean, what exactly happens in, in town when they have, uh, for instance, uh, political dynasty? Okay, so you're really excuse me. <laughs> so this is how um, it means that um, when there's a higher share of political dynasty, uh, remember that the variable, when we define it, it's for province. So for those municipalities in that province, they will have the same um, data for that um, dynasty. So it means that um, it contributes to the decrease, decrease in probability. So meaning if they have recovered, if relative to a municipality with, let's say, with no political dynasty, that one, that municipality with dynasty, would have lower probability of recovery for having the dynasty. So that's how you would interpret the results relative to the other ones. Okay. We still have uh, 20 minutes or one hour. So please ask your questions at the back door. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Ben. Well, actually, this uh, forum is very timely in the sense that uh, currently at the Office of Civil Defense, and from Office of Civil Defense, by the way, we are um, trying to look into uh, revision and updating of the National Dream Plan. And uh, I'm looking forward really to meet Dr. Sani Domingo. I've been reading your studies from um, utilization of fund up to uh, sectoral and institutional assessment. So I'm familiar with some of your findings. So my question for you, sir, is that um, given this, uh, we, there have been uh, a clamor for us to be a department, what do you think would be the implication of the, the move also of PRDT on having, uh, what do you call this, um, for us to be a federal government, what would be the implication for the regional offices, given this structure that you have presented? Secondly, uh, on your findings on DR funding or tagging of funding, you have assessed your DRM based on the priority actions of L NCCAP, I believe. Are you are you familiar with the COA with the COA circular that is uh, the guidelines on the utilization of entry fund and the local dream fund? 
And secondly, what is your analysis given that uh, the, the, the efforts were pointing into, I think, human security and human security and sustainable energy. And for uh, Dr. Rabago, I have also questions for you. First, um, what is your definition of recovery? Second, can you explain to us the multi-stage sampling that you did? And this, uh, does this include those uh, vulnerable populations or those areas uh, who are affected by, uh, by disasters previously? This is based on your finding, you have said that 67% said that they have coped up and the other thing is a higher, a higher statistic saying 72% more or less saying that they have, um, for me it sounds to have, to have this build back better when it comes to recovery where in fact there have been a, a lot of issues happening right now when it comes to recovery of Yolanda, even Yolanda. So I hope you can enlighten them. Ask on this matter. Thank you. So, Dr. Domingo, would you like to go first? Okay, uh, very interesting question. The first one, uh, we're going to talk about that concrete uh, organizational structure for the new Department of Disaster Resilience. It's a very complicated talk right now because you are actually eating up so many institutions in government. You are trying to firm up an institutional platform for DRM, which is based on existing institutions. So it's really about uh, rebalancing everything, uh, compromising with uh, the heads of institutions, and coming up with that firm commitment to be one, and to have that uh, undivided focus between CC and DRR. So the new department is going to meet up, hopefully, supposedly, like the Climate Change Commission, OCD supposedly can have that uh, option to transfer to the new department. Um, it's also going to have that early warning capacity with Pagasa, FGP, and field votes as, as part of the new department. Plus, it's going to have teeth implementation-wise because they're trying to also get the Bureau of Fire Protection and the Coast Guard. So you have bodies on the field who are able to respond. Having that body really is going to be quite an eventful uh, moment for the RRM advocates because it's going to be a huge step towards having that uh, very, very strong effort towards resiliency building. Now, so that's one of having that new um, institutional platform within government that would house a very, very strong uh, initiative towards the RM and climate change adaptation. Now, talking about the shift uh, into a federal form of government, there are actually templates that we can use wherein we can translate that national organizational setup into a federal form. You can look at Malaysia, you can look at Australia, you can look at New Zealand, you can look at Nigeria in, in, in Africa. All of these have federal uh, forms of government and they have federal forms of TRM organizational structures. So it's, it's inevitable that if you're going to have a federal system that you'd have independent DRM offices within your sub-states. But I guess in terms of augmentation, it, it's quite universal that uh, an augmentation of assistance is forthcoming from the national body once sub-states are uh, unable to cope with shocks. So probably it's going to be a national organizational platform with its counterpart within independent states if you have a federal form of, of government. Um, What's the other question? COA. Okay, we've seen Form 7, we've seen Form 8 being submitted by local governments to OCD as well as COA. But in terms of typologies, in terms of structures, they don't have that. Unlike with climate change expend, uh, expenditure tagging, it's very structured. For DRM, 
it's very chaotic. So the RM expenditures being reported are itemized really without classification. So it's quite difficult to, to make sense as to what the reported figures are. That's one issue. Another issue is there's no body that's been looking at um, systematically analyzing those submissions. So that's a gap and has to be addressed. Thank you. Dr. Roman. Thank you for that um, clarificatory questions. Uh, with regards to the multi-stage sampling design, um, when we did it, we, we took the data from Project NOAA, what would be the higher risk province and the low risk province, and what who are the ones in the middle. So we had to take that into account. Now, um, so we had to make sure that the risk in terms of the ranking based on Project NOAA is represented because we're looking at disaster. Now we also consider the poverty, in the poverty incidences in these um, provinces and also the population. We did consider that um, as weight you know, in choosing um, the provinces. Now within the province, I think there's another one where we got the data. Uh, the municipality would also have classification whether they are high risk or low risk. So meaning within the province, there's a classification and that can serve as our basis for choosing our sample. So the sample uh, has to be, even the number, uh, it would need to give us the power in statistics so that when we interpret the results, it's valid. So that's how we uh, chose the sample. Now, uh, with regards to recovery, thank you for that. So uh, I need to point out that the survey is perception-based because we are asking the dream officers. So it's their perception whether this is at the municipality level, whether the municipality has completely recovered. So probably it could mean that um, everything is back to normal. That's why we have to ask uh, the state of recovery, whether it's better than before or um, not yet, right? So that's why we have to qualify what they mean by recovery. Now, you are right. Um, probably we will see in Yolanda um, affected areas that some families have not completely recovered. That's that, but that is at the household level. So um, it, the, we had a paper on, at the household level using the survey, social protection survey of PCEB. Uh, that at the household level, we also asked that same question. And um, we had about 3,000 samples for that, and we offered sample at the Yolanda areas. So we have an accompanying paper, it's posted as working paper at the UP School of Economics. So we're asking the household. So that would be the perception of the household, whether they have recovered from the shock or disaster that they have experienced. So we have to keep in mind who are the ones answering the question. So it would be a different perspective and different level. Thank you. Some questions? Yes, sir, please. Sorry, for, sorry, Maha, since you, uh, you sort of opened up the issue about dynasty somewhat, but then uh, you were trying to veer out of it. <laughs> um, but because, uh, let me just explain to people what the, because Ron Mendoza and I wrote a, 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 a policy note here at PIBS about this issue about dynasties. And our point was really just that uh, it's the fat dynasties that are causing problems, more harm than the so-called thin dynasties. And by fat and thin, you might say, what exactly do we mean? The whole point about counting people are, whether it's counting, how many of the politicians currently are dynasties? Well, you, what you do is you say, is mayor now having uh, related to the last mayor, or is there, is he or she related to somebody in the current political uh, governance? Huh? So, what we what we sort of saw was that it 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 maybe, if I might say it in in Filipino better, yung saring sabay sabay. <laughs> yun yung mas nakaka-harm, no? na marami sila kesa sa yung pinapalitan sila. Okay? For our, the benefit of those who are, who are not speakers of Filipino, those who are uh, coming from fat dynasties are the ones where 
everybody you know, comes from the same family, all at the same time in, in the same period, you know, as against somebody getting replaced. Uh, well, for instance, if my wife, I don't have a wife, but if I did have a wife, she replace, replaces me in the next election. So that's a thin dynasty. So the question that I have econometrically would be, rather than using the share, would, would it matter because it's, it's a governance issue? Because what we were advocating is in fact the regulation as is supposed to be done by the Constitution. We're supposed to be regulating dynasties, but Congress has not passed that law. Okay? It's not that bad. All dynasties are bad. That's what we're saying. And we're not even saying that just because it's a dynasty, a dynasty, you can see. Not necessarily just because you're a dynasty, you're evil. You know? So we're in fact saying that perhaps it's a governance issue because some people just, I won't say more than that. Okay, thank you. Maybe you can just tweak. Yeah. Uh, um, we'll probably do another run because we used one measure and I think we had, we looked at the other measures as well, but it did uh, look significant. So what we're reporting only is the significant ones. But we'll do another run. Thank you. Yes. Um, since Toots also mentioned that he left Maritina when you experienced Ondoy, uh, another area of research which we haven't done what we'd like to do is the migration related to um, disaster. So that's also another important um, research area. Like what happened in Mount Punetubo, one whole barangay has to migrate. But that would be a different experience. What they're saying is because they're surrounded by the same neighbors, same families, somehow recovery was, you know, um, made easy because of that. But of course, there would be other um, families like too, so what has the means to migrate, but some would, wouldn't have the means. So that would also be an important thing to look at, to connect this. So if there's a PSD here, please include that. So, I don't know if yes, yes sir. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm RJ Parkoy. I'm a researcher from the Foreign Service Institute. Um, it's an uh, arm of the DFA. Um, allow me to actually stray away from the government institutions to um, community participation. Because um, two years ago, I went to Japan for a training session under JICA. Um, it was there that I realized how their communities actually are very active, not just in terms of implementing what's in the local and national um, laws, no? But, e but even until the formulation and crafting of the laws, they're really, really active. So I, I just want to know if it's the same here in the Philippines um, in terms of community participation and what can we actually do in order for us to enhance um, or to strengthen the role of communities in terms of DRR. Thank you. Okay, uh, community participation. But in principle, it's it's very, very critical that you have community participation. You're going to look at LGAU pro progressively dealing with the RM. For example, in the course of crafting, there are two major documents that look at the CDP. They have to have that barangay level uh, participatory engagement. But uh, it's probably unfortunate to say that uh, that kind of extensive coverage is quite relative uh, in those different localities. There are very progressive um, local government units who are able to get inputs from all barangays that they are covering. And that inform um, the crafting of the CDPs, the groups and even the investment programs that they have. But it's very relative, and the standards set in terms of them actually um, covering all of those inputs, not only from barangay officials, but also from community members, is, is uh, quite arbitrary in many ways, quite subjective. Now, if you're going to ask about standards, quality assurances in crafting, for example, our local uh, government documents. The eventual product, we've asked this, uh, uh, we've, we've gone around and we've asked about uh, 
the standards of those um, development uh, documents that they have in localities. The eventual product really uh, is very arbitrary in terms of standard. Uh, I don't know if it's um, a good statement on my part or if it's really reflective of what we have uh, nationally. But uh, in those localities we talk to, the end products, the actual groups, the actual CTPs really are subjectively reflecting inputs, not only from communities, but also from thematic plans. And that includes CC and DRR local development plans. So I guess that's an avenue for augmentation. And uh, if you're going to talk about, for example, of mainstreaming CC and DRR, it's a must that uh, those two major documents contain inputs from the local CC plan as well as local DRR plan. And that's not really happening in all uh, localities. It's happening in some. The standard uh, they mentioned really is in the process. So there's no editor, there's no one looking at the eventual content of CDPs and groups in terms of uh, what they need to contain. But um, there is a standard in terms of the steps they have to take before coming up with those two major documents. So, yeah, that's my answer. Thank you. Yes. I just want to share. Hello. Um, everyone here, if you're a Filipino citizen, if you have resided in your barangay for the past six months, if you're age 15 and above, you are a member of your barangay assembly. What does this mean? You are essentially your congressman for your barangay. You don't have to be a registered voter. If you're 15 and above, and you've been in your barangay for six months, you're a member of your barangay assembly. So at least twice a year, go to your barangay assembly. Find out what's the barangay plan. Or actually, if you want actual direct action, go to your barangay today, tomorrow. Go there and ask for your BDRMC minutes. What has the Barangay Disaster Management Committee been doing over the past five years? Find out what your disaster plan is, if there is one. If there isn't one, kulitin niyo po ng barangay. That's your job as a citizen. You don't have to get authority from government. You're a citizen. Do your civic duty. Yes, ma'am. So um, I have a question for, uh, I'm Dian from uh, EMI, Earth Group and Mega Cities Initiative, a UN, um, uh, part of the UN Global Platform on Disasters. Um, so my question is um, for both Dr. Ravago and Dr. Domingo. So with regards to the long-term precautionary measures, uh, so the current government officials, for example, are not investing in long-term um, um, measure. So what, what can be the governance implications of this? Because uh, for in terms of resilience, maybe we are also looking at the long-term institutional arrangements and uh, what can maybe be done because uh, we are being limited by this um, constraint in terms of our institutional arrangements. That's a good question, no? But I'm also thinking of that. We have to develop like a way that it could be win-win. Like what I've said, probably most of the time, what we observe is that um, the local governments or people in the position would not invest in long-term precautionary measures because nga, um, the benefits would not accrue. Because it translates to votes, right? And they all also have their limited resources. So I guess we have to make it salient so we can think of a way such that um, you know the incentives would be win-win it's win-win for us, of course, but how could you make it, how can you make it, um, let's accept the, the reality that what they are spending, right, they, it's, of course it's taxpayers' money, but somehow it translated to votes, but right now I cannot, you know, and we're thinking of that. <laughs> Maybe the practitioners here would have an idea. Dr. Domingo, would you like to add? Okay, this is probably, a special instance where Finn Dynasty can do good. Because we're looking at long-term uh, precautionary measures, and these guys are in those uh, posts locally for an extended period, and probably they'll reap the benefits of those uh, investments. 
locally. But yes, the, the very arbitrary nature of leadership within many local governments uh, actually lead to them not investing so much on, on these long-term uh, investments. So that's that. And hopefully we remedy that. Since there are no longer questions, I would like to thank our our um, presenters, Dr. Rabago and Dr. Domingo, for giving us comprehensive um, insights. And of course, uh, for the active participation of our audience this afternoon. See you all in our future activities.